know, yesterday. Maybe show you uh, some thoughts and plots for the uh, future heavy iron program at the LHC. And I, I don't restrict fully to jet physics, but uh, take it a little broader. Um, as, a, as a starting point, just let me remind the timeline for the LHC. So we, we just, uh, we are just now coming out of long shutdown two, where Alice and LHCB have upgraded uh, significantly their detectors. And in the next long shutdown in, in about four years from now, Atlas and CMS will upgrade the detectors. Um, and I'll, I'll go a bit into detail of, I will show some details of that, but let me remind you that the reason for this timing is to some extent that uh, for heavy ions, high luminosity starts now. We have a, a increase by, or we expect an increase by a factor of more than five of the uh, luminosity at the LHC for the coming years. Uh, while for proton-proton physics, the high luminosity really starts after the next long shutdown. So that is why Atlas and CMS uh, upgrade in the next long shutdown. And you see here uh, an overview of the, of the heavy ion luminosity that we have had collected so far, and then how it's expected to increase over the years. And also going beyond from five and six. Now, so as I mentioned, Atlas and CMS will do their main upgrades in a few years from now. Um, just wanted to still remind you what is coming. So they uh, have the phase two upgrades in the next long shutdown. And what is most relevant for heavy ion physics is that they will improve the, um, the, the tracker tracking acceptance. They will, they will completely replace the trackers and they will cover up to four units of rapidity, uh, plus minus four units. And they're also installing a time of or timing detectors, which are meant to reduce pileup, but can also be used to do particle identification, for example, for for decay products of heavy flavor. And um, there are also improvements in the muon systems. The so CMS has already, uh, or will be doing something in the next long shutdown. Atlas has already done some things now. And uh, there will be CDC upgrades for both Atlas and CMS. Now for uh, LHCB and LEs, the upgrades uh, have already happened to a large extent. So LHCB has uh, re replaced their, their inner tracker, the Velo tracker. They also have replaced the outer tracker, which is called the, the sci-fi, the scintillating fiber tracker. Uh, although they still plan to upgrade it more in the, in the next long shutdown. And they have uh, improved their PID and also the, the fixed target system, which is also interesting for, for us because that is where they do, for example, P uh, nucleus and even uh, different collisions between different nuclei. And the goal of that upgrade was to, to get a very high rate capability. And that means uh, that they can collect lead lead at 50 kilohertz. Although at this moment, still the tracking does not allow to go to very central collisions in LHCB. And that will change in the, in the next upgrade. Now also Alice has done major upgrades. Um, Alice has replaced uh, the full inner tracking system with a, a pixel based uh, tracker and has replaced the readout chambers of the TPC um, to be able to do continuous readout, which means to keep up with the 50 kilohertz interaction rate that we get in the, in the coming runs. And there are a number of other upgrades, for example, the interaction trigger has changed and there are many, many uh, maintenance and refurbishment uh, type of, of changes like were done in the other detectors. Uh, and the summary here is uh, also that then, then uh, with this upgrade, at least can, can collect 50 kilohertz of lead lead collisions to the full heavy ion luminosity and about 500 kilohertz or a bit more in, in PP for minimum bias and high multiplicity measurements. And at least will also do uh, two other upgrades in the next long shot, place the inner few layers of the tracker with uh, so-called ITS3 which uh, improves again the pointing resolution and reduces the material budget. And one is a forward calorimeter um, that I will show you in the next slide. So now switching a bit to the, to the physics, um, I wanted to start with this uh, initial state or nuclear PDFs. As you know, a lot has been done already, but there's still uh, uncertainties and in particular at low X where there could be this uh, CGC type of effects or nonlinear evolution. Um, and uh, LHCB and Elise are, are really pushing that uh, LHCB with the demeson measurement and in the future with, uh, with the Ryan, uh, measurements as well at low PT where these effects would be strongest. And in Elise, we, we are planning for this focal upgrade 
which is a forward calorimeter, which allows us to measure direct photons in uh, PP and PLED uh, and by zeros in PP, PLED and LED LED and also jet set forward rapidity. And here you see the impact that that will have on the, uh, that the direct photon measurement will have on the, under the knowledge of the, the gluon density in the nucleus. So the, the red band here is um, the constraints coming from the focal data, which you see constrain the, uh, the, the, the nuclear PDFs down to 10 to the, X equals 10 to the minus five and really improve over the, over the other, uh, the existing state of the art, which is the gray and, and the other measurements. And there are other channels we can use like this ultra peripheral collisions, but I, I won't go into that in detail now. So then before going to heavy ions, I also wanted to talk a little bit about what we tend to call small systems, because I know this was also discussed a lot on Tuesday. And it is, I think there are some very interesting connections also with, with our, um, or with the jet medium interactions. But as you know, where it starts is that this observation uh, which was first found by CMS that there are long range correlations in, in eta, uh, azimuthal correlations, which look a lot like elliptic flow. And there we also by now know that they are not just two particle correlations, they are multi-particle correlations. Yeah, just grabbed some recent uh, snapshots of what we, what we have measured. So the signals are fairly large, are of the same order of magnitude as what we see in lead lead. And there is, for example, this, uh, clear uh, mass scaling, which also is indicative of a common flow field. And there are other kind of high density effects observed. For example, this, uh, this multi-strange baryon enhancement, which looks very smooth as you go from PP, via PP at high multiplicity to lead lead. And so what we can do in the upcoming runs is to study this again in more detail and with more precision. Um, and one of the things that I think is very interesting there is, is I wanted to introduce with this slide where I want to remind you that there are kind of two physical pictures for the origin of azimuthal and isotropy or flow. Um, the, the most familiar maybe to us is this hydrodynamical expansion picture uh, where you have a fluid that expands and you have a common flow velocity. Um, and the underlying picture there is really the, a fluid motion, meaning that the mean free path is short with respect to the system side, size. And so this is really appropriate for light flavor at low to intermediate PT and in principle in large systems where the, where the, the mean free path is smaller, than, much smaller than the system size. And then on the other hand, we have this parton energy loss picture or the diffusion picture, which is very similar, um, where the flow really comes from different path lengths. So the short versus the long direction in the, in the elliptic system. Um, and so the underlying picture there is really the interaction of partons with the medium. And I'm calling it underlying picture because in a way the two pictures have to come together. They describe, they're not different physics, but they're just different picture of pictures of the physics that work in different limits. And this picture is very appropriate for jets and for heavy flavor. And one of the big interests in, uh, for this uh, small systems is that this is where you, you see, where you can zoom in on the regime where the two pictures have to somehow match up and maybe theoretically tractable. And this was also discussed by Urs on Tuesday. Unfortunately, I missed his talk. Um, now, how are, we, how are we going to attack this experimentally? So this is an example, the example that I would like to show you. So um, here on the left, you see the current status of uh, flow measurements in small systems in PP and PLED. And one of the striking things that I think we see here, or that we see here is the, um, the, well, charged hadrons and charmed particles have very similar azimuthal anisotropy in PP and PLED. Beauty really has much smaller and it looks even like no azimuthal anisotropy. So it really, that, that is a very interesting effect because it might mean that we have a kind of a cutoff or a, a limit where the, somewhere between charm and beauty, the interactions are not strong enough to generate significant elliptic flow. Now the uncertainties are large and this is one of the things that will improve in, uh, in row three and four. And on a related note, um, we will be able to, to really measure in small systems, but also in large systems, the, the kind of hierarchy between light flavor, open heavy flavor here in blue and then hidden heavy flavor. So the J-Psi uh, here in red. And that will allow us to tell whether the, um, the flow is really built up at the quark level or at the hadron level. So whether um, we see effects of, for example, coalescence, which is one of the 
I would uh, what I will later call systematic uncertainties in our understanding of the of the medium. Now, then, of course, the other big question is: so, if there are these interactions, if, if these are final state interactions, then what about energy loss? And also, there uh, a lot of thought has gone in, and we'll will do measurements in run three and run four that will provide us much more insight there. So, this here on the left, you see projections of the gamma jet asymmet uh, energy asymmetry, which is a fairly direct measure of, uh, of energy loss. Um, and you see that in the future, we'll really get uh, much more precise being sensitive to, sm to potentially small energy loss effects. So we'll really push that. And also uh, similarly with um, hadron jet coincidences, which are similar technique. And here you see those kind of measurements and then translated into a limit on the amount of energy loss. And then, of course, as we discussed yesterday, um, we can we also have this very nice opportunity to go in between to take oxygen oxygen collisions where we have a very controlled symmetric system. And we can also look for energy loss with these type of measurements, but also directly with the or in a more simple measurement with the with the RAA. Um, so I think that will really uh, still tell us more about these interactions in small systems. Now with that, let's uh, let's go to the uh, to the limit of large systems. And one of the the goals of our field is to really uh, understand the properties of the quark gluon plasma and to infer them from data, but also to understand how they come about. So I such as I, what I try to do here is just collect a number of plots with uh, efforts to under to quantify things like the viscosity and the equation of state. And of course, the heavy cork diffusion coefficient and the transport coefficient. Um, I think most of you are familiar with these plots, so they're really here now as, as a kind of icon of all these activities. Um, and it's always a bit double because uh, this, in a way, is an oversimplification, as we all know. Uh, but on the other hand, this is really the, the, a big product of our field. It shows how far we've gone, come in our understanding of these processes. And I think it's fair to say that we now have a very clear understanding of the of many of these transport properties um, with a, an uncertainty. So we also understand their uncertainties and we also understand somehow the, the known unknowns, the things where we still have to push to really make sure that we, that we, that we understand it and that we're not confusing ourselves. Um, and that's what we'll be doing in run three and run four. So I, there will be new inputs for several, what I call systematic uncertainties, for example, on, on hadronization uh, which affects the, the, the flow uh, interpretation, but also medium response, which as we discussed, affects the, affects the, the interpretation of jets and is also interesting on its own right, of course. So I see it a bit that we, we will have these three directions. So one is the uh, new inputs for to reduce some of these uh, uncertainties in specific areas. Then of course, there will be improved precision, which will just help us to narrow down uncertainties. But also, I think very important that we can extend uh, this, what we now call multi-messenger approach, where we do many measurements um, and we try to see whether a really uh, a coherent picture emerges. So, and there we really stress test uh, the models, but also our understanding of the, of the various processes. And we have had a lot of detailed discussion about, about such things in the, in the meeting. Now, one example of how this then will, will go, hopefully, is um, what we will do is we will measure uh, nuclear modification factor. This is uh, of heavy flavor and the elliptic flow of heavy flavor. And the two have in our models, mostly one underlying parameter, which is this diffusion coefficient at low PT and at high PT, the transport coefficient. And for these uh, measurements, we worked out in a rough way what the impact is on our understanding of the transport coefficient. So here you see going from left to right, um, how much more precise the, uh, the, the, the diffusion coefficient uh, measurement becomes. And you also see between, for the, between the red and the blue that the impact of hadronization really then becomes a, an important uh, effect in this, in this discussion. And you see on the, on the right from a different set of models, a similar story. So the, really the um, uncertainties will, will shrink and our systematics, systematic understanding will improve. Now, this, uh, of course, also goes for jets, where now the, the focus of the, of the jet field is not so much to pin down these, these uh, transport coefficients at the moment, but rather to understand 
the, the mechanisms for uh, the interactions and for energy loss. And so one big subfield there is, as you know, one big tool is uh, are the jet shapes and jet structure, um, where the motivation is really to, to study radiation patterns. For example, uh, hard medium induced branchings, uh, coherence effects where there are some sketches on the right. Uh, this, uh, what we discussed yesterday, the hard recoil or acoplanarity, uh, but also soft radiation and medium response. And we, I won't now try to go through all of this uh, in detail, but we've been uh, building our toolbox and try and understanding more and more which measurements are sensitive to what. And just as a, as a flavor of what's to come, I show here uh, some projections of measurements for these uh, structure measurements. So these are, here on the left, you have the, the soft drop measurements with the projected uncertainties for run three and run four. And you see that really now we come into a regime where we can um, quantify where we can really determine parameters within these individual models. The, the effects are relatively subtle, um, but with the good precision, we can really nail down the, the underlying physical parameters. And here on the right, you see uh, a similar message, but then for the, the digit acoplanarity, which we, our interpretation of that seems to be changing, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get at least the precision that we need to, to understand these things. And one more thing on, on jet sub substructure. So these are the uh, radial profiles of jets. And also just to give you a flavor of how, the, how much the precision will improve, I show here from a CMS projection for the radial profiles where you really see that the, the wake effect or the medium re response at large R um, will become much, our understanding will become much more precise of our, our measurements. And we can even then extend that to, to heavy flavor. This has started but the, uh, the uncertainties will really shrink by, uh, by a large factor. Now then, um, one other direction I wanted to, to briefly discuss with you is, uh, again, for uh, JETS, is the, 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 the issue or the, the, the topic of fluctuation. So I, what I mean here is really fluctuations in a kind of a broad sense. So um, Coming, so what I mean really is that the degree of quenching differs from jet to jet or event to event. And this comes from uh, different uh, aspects. So one is path length variations. Um, one can be coherence or the dependence on the, on the opening and also fat jets lose more energy. And then there are of course also intrinsic fluctuations that even if you have the same conditions, you don't always have the same uh, amount of energy loss or the same strength of interaction. And this, this gives a kind of a challenge because, um, for example, it means that inclusive jet measurements, they often tend to pick up mostly the, the least modified jets. So that makes us less sensitive, makes it harder to dig into the modifications. Um, but it also is an opportunity because some of these uh, effects are interesting physics effects and we want to understand them by looking at these fluctuations and variations of the energy loss. So one question you can ask is, can we select now jets with a, with a, large medium, a large medium effect and study them to somehow improve our sensitivity to medium effects? And there are a number of ways to do that, um, even with inclusive jets by looking at multiple observables, um, but also with, of course, recoils or correlations, head-on jet, 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 and boson jet. And, there, of course, um, to do these differential studies, you also need large data samples. Um, and I wanted to just briefly show you a few pictures of the, uh, the main tool in that area, which is the gamma jet uh, or boson jet measurements, where, um, as you know, so this is the proton-proton result and the lead-lead result and the, the broadening of the energy imbalance that you see here it's really a direct measure of these fluctuations of the energy loss. So a jet that sits here at xj equals 0.5, uh, th those are events where jets were modified a lot. And the ones that, that are here near one are ones where the jets didn't get modified a lot. And so we can use this to really select uh, cases where the energy loss is large and small. Um, with the caveat that, that in PP, you also have fluctuations and we somehow have to still find a little bit of way to how to fairly compare the two. But I think with the coming runs and, and the, the evolving understanding, we will, we will manage that. Now, and then of course you can go further and you can use this also to measure uh, fragmentation functions. And 
one of the things that we've seen there is that if you do gamma jet fragmentation measurements, the, the energy loss effects are larger. Um, so that's also just a way to somehow zoom in on the energy loss effects. And we understand that to be because, uh, because of the different selection bias, basically, that you uh, have uh, reconstructed energy versus the photon energy, and also, of course, quark versus gluon jets. Now, and again, to just show you a little bit, to give you a flavor of what's coming, here are some projections for the, for the coming run. So this was the result I just showed you with half, half an inverse nanobarn. In the middle, you see a projection for the gamma jet symmetry uh, with 10 inverse nanobarn. You see that the error bars shrink a lot. And in fact, uh, please pay, pay attention. So what shrinks uh, most are the statistical error bars. So that means we can also, for example, go to higher jet uh, energy, or we can slice this and then look at another observable. Um, and then similar story for the, um, for the fragment distributions, for the, the jet fragmentation, where the blue points are the current results and the red and black points here are the projection for run three and four. So that's really <coughs> the uh, statistics. <laughs> okay. So now before closing, I wanted to spend still a few words on the, on the future beyond run three and four. So this is, I, I realize this is far away, but we have to, to plan ahead. Um, and LHCB and Alisa are, are preparing um, plans for upgrades for run five and six. So in LHCB, it's, uh, the, the focus is really on uh, higher rates and also this uh, timing to reduce pileup, which also means that they can then handle central lead, -lead collisions uh, in uh, run, run five and six. Um, and in Alice, we, are, we have prepared a, a proposal for Alice 3, which is a, a complete rebuild of Alice um, with, with a very large acceptance tracker, which with really excellent pointing resolution, I'll show you a little bit what that, what that brings, and uh, identifications of electrons and hadrons, but also an electromagnetic calorimeter and muon identification. And of course, Atlas and CMS will do their upgrades a few years earlier and have these upgrades in run five and six as well, because that's where they collect the bulk of their, of their PP data as well. Now, um, since I'm from Alice and uh, I wanted to highlight the Alice 3 physics program uh, with two slides. So this is uh, really just a brief overview of some of the things that can be done with this LS3 detector. And uh, the, 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 the core of the physics program in heavy ion physics is really the, our measurements of thermal radiation and chiosymmetry restoration, mostly with uh, electron positron pairs. And here on the right, you see the dielectron mass spectrum with its precision. And as you know, at the moment, we are, we are only just starting a program of that at the LHC. And this is really a, a, a core a, a aspect of, of getting at the temperature of the early stage. Now, then in addition, there are, is a, a rather broad field of heavy flavor transport and thermalization, which we are, as you all know, are already working on, but where we can make still uh, significant inroads with, for example, the Lambda BV2 measurement, uh, which will improve significantly in precision. And we can go to look at um, chemical equilibration in the charm sector by measuring multi-charm baryons. Now, and then there are a number of other areas like the D star correlations for the for hadron structure and the exotic states um, and, and some BSM searches and so on. I'll, I won't go into detail that, there now, but I wanted to highlight one specific aspect which connects to discussions we've had this week, which is the for LS3 that we, um, the, the, the performance for DD bar pairs. So, and it starts from the, the single D meson level. So here it's a bit of a busy plot, but on the left, you see the signal to background ratio for LS3, uh, the zeros compared to the current LS setup and Atlas and CMS have, have similar performance. And you see that at low PT, there's a large increase in the signal to background ratio uh, accompanied by a large increase in the efficiency, which means that really you can get a much more pure sample of uh, these and the bars. And that then allows to do these type of measurements of DD bar as a methyl correlations. So this is the one performance plot that we, that we prepared based on these numbers, but that really critically depends on this excellent performance for, for PID or for heavy flavor identification. And this, these type of measurements give access to, um, as we discussed, uh, gluon splitting by looking at DD bar on the near side, maybe also in jets. Um, it gives access to heavy flavor acoplanarity by looking at back-to-back DD-bar -back pairs. 
Um, and it allows a, a bunch of studies of heavy flavor fragmentation, not only with D mesons, but also with lambda B, lambda Cs and, and the beauty sector. So with that, I, I would like to summarize. So I think uh, I've tried to show you that the LHC experiments are gearing up for round three and four, and that uh, LHCB and Alice have done really major upgrades. Um, and Atlas and CMS are also did some upgrades and are ready for data taking. So what we'll do, we'll collect very large data samples with improved detectors, which leads to this kind of two-pronged approach of increased precision, but also more differential measurements, which uh, allow us to zoom in on specific effects. And then in round three, uh, in round four, Atlas and CMS will do their phase two upgrades, which extend the rapidity reach for the tracker and the hadron ID. And in round five and six, LHCB and Alice, and Alice will upgrade to the next level. And I just showed you what that brings. So I think there's really, exciting times ahead for jet physics at the at the LHC. Thanks for your attention. Oh, thank you very much, Marco. So we open the floor for questions and the Zoom participants can raise their hand. I see one there. Peter first. Yeah, thanks, Marco. You got a slide on small systems and jet energy laws. Oh, sorry. Now I went too far. Uh, this one, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, this is actually something we did. We were discussing earlier in the week, and um, I think there's, you know, there's projections here. I mean, there's this this proposal by the CERN Theory Group to do minimum bias auction auctions, which is <clears throat> very good as far as it goes. We've, we've seen some, you know, very interesting measurements. We, but the problem, as we discussed earlier in the week, is we can't quite reconcile the, you know, the high PTV two measured by Atlas with other measurements that see no finite uh, effect. And you know, in some cases, we try to set limits, and we'll continue to do that. Atlas will measure your know, magnificent V two out to our really high PT, and then what? I don't think we have collectively. It's not a it's really not a criticism of your talk. It's not a, a criticism of anyone except us collectively. I don't think we have a complete plan to really put all this together. The OO proposal, as I said, it's, it's good as far as it goes, but it is likewise incomplete in the sense that it only applies to minimum bias auction auction. You see something you don't, it's binary. But many of the phenomena we see in small systems are actually for high multiplicity, event activity triggered, and their proposal doesn't work. I've actually been discussing with them and they're kind of, they don't know what to do with, you know, high multiplicity selection. It's not something that's theoretically well controlled. You can't, so it's, so there's a whole component of the small systems that I think we don't, it's gotta be experiment driven. You know, likewise, you know, as Phoenix will have at least, you know, a limited, uh, you know, P gold run and we'll certainly do, you know, good things, but how do we put it all together? I think I just, I don't have an answer. I just want to point out that I think there's a, there's a very significant gap there. We've got you know, a collection of, 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 of measurements, but lacking the, let's say the conceptual and the kind of the modeling framework to bring them together and to see, you know, is the Atlas V2 and uh, you know, the Hadron jet and you know, whatever RAAs and Q, you know, QP LEDs you measure, are these giving a consistent picture or not? I don't think we've got a framework to actually answer that yet, but that's what, you know, well, that was a comment, but maybe you have some thoughts on that. No, I, yeah, I, I would take it mostly as a comment, I, but I think we, I agree that we don't know the end game. I do think pe many people have ideas. Um, and one thing I would like to point out is that, for example, for these asymmetry measurements, really, if you want to go down to the type of energy loss that you that you expect, which I, I think is of the order of a GeV or so, it's it's really a, smaller than in in lead lead. Uh, we really need to push this because we by now our limits are still high enough on the energy loss that wouldn't dare to say that there's no energy loss in significant V2. We haven't seen energy loss yet, um, but I don't think we know that it is inconsistent, but uh, we need to, and that's not only an experimental effort, we need to work on this. Um, okay, so I have a question on the Alice 3. So I noticed there is no hydron colorimeter. And so uh, I'm just wondering will that impact the jet performance because that's a important aspect if we want full jets. So is there yes. any projection? So uh, two, two remarks. So uh, yes, a very good question. Um, the, there is no hadron calorimeter in this picture. We, have, we are discussing because there is a muon uh, detector 
And it would, in principle, so with an absorber, and one can, of course, instrument this absorber and have a hadronic calorimeter. And there are, there are groups that are interested in this. So it, it's something that we are also looking into. Um, of course, it also costs money, so we have to see how to, to square the bill. But, and the other thing is that uh, that question that you asked, I think, is the key question. How, how does this impact? How important is this for jet um, performance? And that is something that I think we should try to, to study in a bit more detail. So in, as you know, in Alice so far, we've been using electromagnetic calorimeter with a tracker to do full jets where you, of course, you miss some of the neutral, neutral variants. And there are some trade-offs that one that we have to understand, I think. Yeah. I see, thank you. Yeah, because that's an important factor. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I think there's a bit of a debate to be had whether those should be called full jets or not, but that, that wasn't actually my, my question. It was, um, again, on Alice 3, can one somehow comment on what the, the virtuality of that uh, experiment is? <laughs> yes, I mean, uh, it's coming on shell. So what has happened now is we, we there's, there's a letter of intent, which was reviewed by the LHCC. Uh, and uh, with a very positive reply, um, so the, they encourage us to go ahead with the uh, with the R and D and with forming uh, the, so forming. I wanted to say forming a collaboration. It, the, the collaboration will be based around the Alice collaboration, but since these are really new detectors, it needs a bit of a reconfiguration, and um, this is now being discussed. So there's a real planning effort also with for resources that is now uh, ongoing and i think in a i mean all lights are green but uh, now it needs to uh, it needs to converge so yeah okay and last question yeah so i had a question that was similar to what you was asking and so i mean i think that in addition to really reconstructing full jets it's the hadronic calorimeter would be very useful in really exploiting the full luminosity that you were showing in your, your luminosity plots um, earlier in run five and run six. So I, I think the hadronic calorimeter, you know, this is a huge upgrade and that would make it uh, even more exciting, I think. Uh, and my other question is more of a factual, my, my question is more factual. When is run five scheduled to be? I, I missed that, I'm sorry. It's, it's 2032, I think, starting. So it was on my first slide and the way, I mean, oh, so now it's even a little later. So it's, it's 2035, 2032 is the start of long shutdown four, and then there will be one year or one year plus, uh, and then round five will start. 15 years from now for the foreseeable future. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I don't think it will slip. The, I mean, it may slip one or two years over time, but it won't uh, slip five years in the next five years, I, I hope. <laughs> okay, I think we should thank Marco one more time. Thanks.